Hello and welcome to History Happened Everywhere. The Verdict. This is our after show podcast where we look back at the previous Euro special episode. So if you haven't listened to that, go back, check it out, or you will be spoiled by the spoilers ahead. Paul, what's the more irritating football noise? <coughs> or <laughs> what silence? That one second. I'm trying to I'm trying to do a Fubu Sailor in my head. Oh god. How does a Fubu Sailor go? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of close is it <laughs> god itchy piles hello and welcome to history happened everywhere the verdict i'm peter goddard i'm here with my good friend co-host ryan weir hello and the ever-present ever judgmental mr paul dursley hello Hello, Paul. <laughs> Hello, Ryan. <laughs> Love that he needs to have a drink before he even interacts with you for the first time. Oh, is that, is that what it was? I thought it was himself. cowbells. I thought he's just got a little... <laughs> no, I heard the posture. clink of... I know the clink of ice when I hear it. <laughs> Hello, Paul. Hello, Ryan. How are you? It's lovely hearing your voice. For now. I'm having a gin and tonic tonight. Are you going to describe how you've made it? Um, well, I make gin and tonic with one 150 ml can of tonic water and then mm-hmm. half of that volume of gin and a, a, a couple of slices of lemon peel and lots of ice. A, fr- a friend of mine had a whiskey on a glacier in Argentina with the ice straight from the glacier. Hello, Paul. Hello, Ryan. Are we going to do this a third time? Yes. <laughs> I feel like I'm in some sort of English basic language for beginners course. <laughs> Show me the way to the station. <laughs> yes, I can swim. <laughs> it was always about town halls in, in my exercise yeah, books. Yeah, I French. spent less of my life in town halls than French led me to expect. <laughs> yeah, it's town halls, stations and squares. The one word that I can remember from almost over a year's worth of Italian uh, is uh, cineconcesi, which is chopsticks. That'll be handy. Which is handy when you're in Italy and <laughs> not likely to be eating Chinese food. Well, that's not a very good hit rate for a year, is it, if you can remember one word? The problem <laughs> is, I don't know what the Italian is for spoon or fork. I think forchetta is fork, isn't it? Although I prefer a spoon. No way. Spoon or fork, Paul? Well, a spoon is much older than a fork. A fork is a relatively modern invention. Really? Yeah, oh, oh, yes. That's why the Americans eat like monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can't use a fork properly. For the benefit of our American listeners, we would like to apologise immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we get underway, it is traditional to do a one-minute summary. Now, this time we have two summaries to get let's try and get it in a minute ryan if you want to start you were the first half and hand over to me and we'll see how it goes okay sounds good and go Denmark has a long history of soccer dating back to the 1870s, wherein they quickly established themselves as a world-class force. In fact, the Danish national team have been consistent in their recent appearances at both the World Cup and the Euro tournaments from the 80s to the present day. In 2007, however, while trying to qualify for the 2008 competition, disaster struck during a now infamous match with arch-rival Sweden. With just one minute left on the clock, a Danish player was red-carded and a penalty awarded to Sweden. An angry Danish fan ran onto the pitch and attacked the referee. The game was abandoned and Sweden given the win. Ultimately, Denmark failed to qualify for the tournament and blame is placed squarely on the shoulders of the drunken fan as everyone in Denmark feels blue for a long, long time. In the second half, we discovered the three post-war Germanys, East Germany, West Germany and Saarland, and remembered the miracle of Bern in 1954 when West Germany beat the Hungarian Mighty Magyars to win the World Cup. We learned 1964 was the first year of the West German top league, the Bundesliga, when Berlin's Hertha BSC were demoted for breaching salary caps. This led to Berlin's third best team being unexpectedly promoted to the top flight, where they promptly delivered one of the worst football seasons in history. In East Germany, we found the teams formed around industry, locomotive or railway teams, and Dynamo were secret police teams. The head of the secret police wanted a great team in Berlin, so he 
forced all the best players in the team Dynamo Dresden to transfer to Berlin. We learned how East and West played to decide who'd represent United Germany at the Olympics, and we revisited the group stage of the 74 World Cup, the only time East and West German teams met at full strength. East Germany won the match, but then West Germany went one better and won the entire tournament. Last week's episode done, summarised nicely, nice one son, now we're over to a young Dursley who's gonna tell you what he thought of me, he'll take you apart without any care, he's the lovely Paul Dursley, the lovely Paul Dursley. So, there we are. That was episode 31, our Euro special. It was rather like a football match. In that you didn't yeah. watch. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was long and tedious with a few highlights. Oh, no. I feel like uh, the floodlights have been been switched off and we're alone in the field, in the stadium, See, by that, ourselves. That's the difference between you and me, Ron. I heard there were a few highlights. <laughs> and some other noise. <laughs> <laughs> right, so why don't we start then, Paul? Yes. What were the few highlights? Let's start with those. Let's start positive. I liked Ronnie, and I was just comparing his apology with our esteemed Prime Minister's attempt at apologies and how different they are. Yeah, it, it was interesting to compare Ronnie's effusive apology upon apology to recent apologies made by politicians in this country who basically don't apologise at all. They don't. That seems to be fairly common practice now in politics, it seems. I believe they call it the non-apology apology. Do they? Is that a true thing? Yeah, it's a real thing. That's uh, like, if, I, if you were offended, I apologise, which means I don't think you should have been offended and I'm not actually just going to say I'm sorry for what I did. <laughs> right, okay. You, yeah, you don't expect the Danes to sort of get hat up about anything, do you? I actually looked him up on the internet and he looks sort of quite a normal, boring person. He'd had a rough run, hadn't he? That's, uh, I mean, that's why it was such a sad tale, because he's obviously just made this one colossal error after a really rough period of his life. And yeah. I guess I personally have had a number of Ronnie Norvig-esque moments that didn't take place in front of the glare of TV cameras and I got away with nobody really noticed or I didn't quite do them as effectively <laughs> as Ronnie did. So, mm. But wh why didn't he monetize it? Uh, because his life was being threatened, I think. But now he can monetize it. Yeah, write a book. That is true. I, I did some tentative research to try and see if I could locate him. Yeah, you know, maybe give a comment. But as I got closer to maybe finding him, I thought, you know what, the guy. <laughs> it's been a long time. Maybe just let it go. Who's the one? Who's the one who bit people? Luis Suarez. But he's not Danish, is he? No, Luis Suarez is not. Oh, okay. Uruguayan, I believe. I wonder if he was named after the Luis Suarez, who was the Spanish midfielder in the 1964 Euro Championship for Spain. I mean, I just think Louis and Suarez pretty are name. pretty common. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so going back to Ronnie Norvig, there was a sort of semi-Ronnie Norvig moment in the news this week in the Tour de France, wasn't there? So there was a lady who held a sign out on in the road in the Tour de France, rather overstepped the bounds, and the cyclist crashed into her, then went down, and then every other cyclist behind cr comes crashing to the ground. Yeah. The whole Tour de France was a bit of a mess as a result. Uh, and she had a similar moment of horrible opprobrium, didn't she? I read today that the French Tour de France people... Tour organisers. The tour, the tour de people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they initially were going to sue her, much like poor old Ronnie. Um, but today they actually said, no, we're not going to do that now. Which no. I, I feel is fine. It's a mistake, right? I mean, Ronnie's was more than a mistake because there was a certain degree of intent. But this woman made a massive error, but... Really, is it worth hammering someone for... What was Ronnie sued for? Like a million euros, was it? Yeah, it was a million euros at first, and then they brought that down to 32,000 euro. Paul, what's your thoughts on that? Like, I mean, I feel like as a judge, this ought to be your bread and butter. Like, do you think that well, you know, the rules I, are there? Well, I, I, would, I would take the million euros and try and earn more than that um, in fees and things. Oh, what, like give interviews and yes. write books and things like that? Do you think you've got it in you, Paul, to drink 15 pints of lager and then find yourself on a pitch attacking a referee i don't think i could drink 15 pints of lager i i was never very good with the volume actually i the it's 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 the volume that got me um uh, it sort of just sent me to sleep after about four pints so you don't you don't get violent you don't attack people when you're drinking um i, I think well i think generally i'm a happy drunk oh that's nice i can picture that
One thing I didn't know was the palaver with all of the football teams in Berlin and and how both sides in the Cold War were using it as the showcase and make, doing silly things. Yeah, I was pretty pleased when I discovered that, that they were both quite doing these parallel things in their different ways. So the East, or rather the West, just kind of randomly promoting poor old Tasmania. And then in the East, that horrible, horrible secret policeman going, right, I'm going to just take the best team and move them into Berlin. It was uh, quite a neat parallel there. I was quite lucky, I think. Yeah, I, and so I was thinking about that and I... It, I also was thinking how old I am because I went, I've been to East Berlin when it was East Berlin. Wow. Very cool. Were you a hostage being exchanged on Checkpoint Charlie? (laughs) No, but I went through Checkpoint Charlie to go in and out. It was sort of a weird thing. You sort of stood in this cubicle that was basically two foot square box with a door at the front and a door at the back and then there was a guard you know, 18 inches in front of your face looking at your passport scrutinizing it wait are you in the box with the guard or is he outside of the box well the guard at... is outside the box but he's got like a big window looking in i thought that would be intimidating walking into a two foot by two foot box and there's a man <laughs> close <laughs> nose the door to nose. <laughs> passport (laughs) (laughs) then you had to give them money you had to give them 20 deutschmarks for which they gave you 20 ostmarks oh Oh, that was their way of getting western currency in wasn't it yes it was did you smuggle denim jeans in was that that kind of era no well yes it was it was that it was that kind of era but it was just so difficult to spend this 20 ostmarks because things were so cheap. We went to the Alexanderplatz, which is like the big centre of East Berlin, uh, and sort of an outside bar that was over overlooking the main square. Had beer was 20p a pint. This was in 1987, so beer here was about £1.50 a pint, and they were selling it for 20p. Okay, and the address of this uh, <laughs> establishment? <laughs> how do I time travel? <laughs> I think it's interesting that you said you went there, actually, because in my head, it's, it was a real verboten no-go, you don't get to go to the East. So did you need to get a visa or something, or did you just roll on and as long as you paid up your money, you went through? Well, for, for, for Westerners, it was very easy to get in. You just queued up, paid your money and went over. You sort of got you got the visa when you handed the money over, but the other way around, it was quite difficult. How cause... easy would it have been to have seen a football match? Uh, I think once you're in East Berlin, it's, it's quite easy. But you have to uh, you have to be out by ten o'clock that day. So how does it work then? So I would I've bought a ticket, or is it like free for the workers? I assume you'd have to pay, but it'd be a nominal amount. I mean, back then, even in this country, football wasn't an expensive day out like it is today. It was a to go down to your local match, pay a few quid, and in you go. It's a rather different proposition now, isn't it? It wasn't a few quid. It was a few shillings because they didn't have to pay the ridiculous salaries that these morons demand. Sorry, these morons' agent demand. It, it sounds like, like if you were living in East Germany, mm-hmm. it would be a good opportunity for you to play in the football team and, and like the the professional team. In quotes. oh, I, I thought you meant me. I don't think so. No, not I, me. I I I, I, um, I I think that Tasmania Berlin could beat me. <laughs> <laughs> Tasmania Berlin versus the Dursley Eleven today. <laughs> That was a weird uh, connection, wasn't it? The Tasmania thing. Yeah, why? What you didn't say why it was called Tasmania? Yeah, th- no one's quite sure. Of, more to the point, I could not find anyone who was quite sure. They they wave wallaby flags and stuff. So I, I think that one of the things said Tasmanian devils. No, I think they they thought that the people were planning to move out to well, Van Diemen's Land or whatever it was called at that time, and but they didn't. I don't know. But no, it, nothing really definitive came up. Hmm. Okay, okay. If anybody knows, let us know. At- H-H-E podcast at gmail.com. Yeah, I'd love to know. Yeah. Um, there was, when you talk about, you were talking about opportunity there and being a professional footballer, right? And one of the things that I didn't talk about, but I did have a little look at was kind of how Eastern European football, having been very competitive, fared after it was became a unified Germany. Mm. Uh, and essentially what happened was the Eastern European teams have tanked and now in the Bundesliga there are only two East German teams. No way, really? Okay. Yeah. From how many? Like, how many were, were there back in the day? Well, there was it was a whole league, wasn't it? So wow. the, I would assume 16, 18 teams were at the top flight of the East Germans. Yeah. Uh, and they were and there were teams that were regularly appearing in European championships as well. So there wasn't a skills gap. It's, I don't know the reason for it, perhaps mm. for the economically, the West is richer, so they buy, and now it's a free market. All the players are getting sucked into West German teams. But uh, 
certainly it seems that East Germany has not fared well in football from unification. Has East Germany fared well in unification full stop? That is an enormous question. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's that. Uh, I, I think we talked about it, or we, we talked about the concept before, but, you know, wh- when they were in the East, they were the top of the bottom, as it were. When they're in the, well, you know, now they're in the West, they're the bottom of the top, you know, which is better. Yeah, they're still Germany. Speaking of, Paul, did you watch the Germany game? No. And by Germany game, you mean England versus Germany? Yeah, that was why I thought we might have seen it. Right. <laughs> So we were hoping, weren't we, Pete, that there was an opportunity that Denmark and Germany would compete against each other during this year's Euro 2020 tournament. But Germany got knocked out. I have a complaint on all of this, actually, because I purchased, as mentioned in the podcast, a 1954 Germany shirt. Yeah. And I thought to myself, wouldn't it be fun? I could wear the German shirt to a few Euro games. It's great on you. Oh, it's a lovely shirt. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. So I, with this in mind, I finished the podcast and then go, right, what's the next German game? Oh, it's Germany, England. Well, I'm definitely not wearing a German shirt <laughs> to an English pub <laughs> for a Germany, England game. Yeah. Uh, and then Germany went out. So I, <laughs> that was it. I guess the podcast I'm wearing only. <laughs> yeah. So World Cup, here it comes. Well, yeah, I guess I'll, um, my time will come, I'm sure. Germany are rarely uh, too far from some interesting tournament that's an interesting point how close do you feel now to being a german fan has, has doing this episode helped form some sort of a little allegiance it in did, you? honestly it did if 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 we hadn't been an england germany game i would have been somewhere rooting for germany for sure yeah i feel the same about denmark and denmark of course are still in the euro 2020 championships as as of recording well i will be going to a denmark game or to watch a Denmark game with you, Ryan, if mm-hmm. only yeah. to sing the song. <gasps> which one? I Re- think you know which one. Recepten or the oh other no. one? Oh no, I think you know. The Drunken Irishies. Do you know, I think that's rather racist. <laughs> <laughs> right. you're, you're, you're stereotyping of the Scandinavian races. Yeah, it is a little bit. It's when you hear Danes speaking Danish, no wonder they all speak English. (laughs) It's very true. Yeah, I mean, thank goodness I got some help with that translation. You got a lot of help. You were magnificently supported by the Danes as a nation, frankly. The the Danish as a nation are full of fantastic, really super helpful people. I mean, we've done a lot of these episodes now, travelled all the way around the world. And with no disrespect to any of the people that we've, we've worked with prior... Just the sheer volume of of help that has been thrown my way from Denmark is extraordinary. I have to defend the Germans slightly because I didn't ask them for help. Um, uh, Pete, you didn't miss much. Uh, when I went to Copenhagen, I saw the Little Mermaid statue and it was very little. <laughs> <laughs> it always struck me as something you might see on a 1970s mantelpiece. Yes, yes. Uh, a sort of a piece of tourist tat. <laughs> <laughs> Trip advisor, here we come. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what is it? What is it with countries like uh, Denmark... Why is such a small country so good at football and other things? Whereas you compare it with a country the same size like Scotland, who are useless. I think it's because the flat earth. (laughs) Okay. Now explain explain yourself. Well, the earth is not round. (laughs) No, I meant... Well, I agree the earth is not round, it's curved. I meant that the, they have a flat land, is what I meant. I didn't mean the earth is flat. <laughs> it's made for football. It's made so for football. Why, it's perfect. I didn't know that as a fact, that the bridges are higher than the highest point of land. Do I get extra bonus point for that? We shall see. Um, because, <laughs> I, I how, well, how are we going to score this? Do I have to score each part separately and one of you wins? I feel like you should evaluate the podcast because that is your job. You are the judge of the podcast. We had a commentator, we had our halves, but that was really just a device to create an an, an artifact of entertainment which is presented to you for your evaluation. Well, that was a load of bollocks, wasn't it? (laughs) You should have seen the arm gestures and everything that was going on. I was at a flourish going. going He was was really enjoying himself. (laughs) 
So we were talking about songs and we were talking about the um, drunken Danish song. Mm-hmm. But what I wanted to talk to you about was recepten, meaning the recipe, as in the recipe for success. Um, I did a little bit more research on it, and um, apparently it was it came about through a newspaper request for lyrics. So do you remember we did the Brazil episode where the newspaper put out a request for a new, for people to design the new Brazil yeah, yeah, uniform? Well, this is very similar. So um, Extra Bledet, who we spoke about, the, you mentioned the newspaper. Them. Which, were they the one that were not good, the tabloid that... Or were they the... One? They were the slightly nicer ones right. towards Ronnie. They were the ones who just gave him the letter R. Ah, yes. <laughs> Which... <laughs> more of a crossword mm. clue. <laughs> Could have been a little bit, a little bit more deceptive, couldn't they? But there you go. Yeah. Anyway, so they asked their readers to submit lyrics for the song. Uh, and so that's what they did. And there were hundreds of submissions received. And uh, I was wondering whether or not, Paul, you wanted to hear what those lyrics actually were. Do you really want a no is the answer to that one? So here they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to hear it anyway, am I? So <laughs> insert lyrics here. <laughs> now, I'm not going to play the song. I'm just going to read you some of the lyrics from it because I thought you might like to um, Okay, is your, to, uh, to see. Is, how's your, what, what how's your Danish? Were. No, this is in English. This is the English translation. If you must. Like the little ugly duckling. So what this is this is uh, identifying that uh, Denmark is the ugly duckling of the football world. Is that Hans Christian Andersen story. Oh, it could well be. Maybe that's what it, that's deep. what it is. That We're makes more sense this. now. This okay, is, this is what an English A level gets you. If you turn red and white on counting, whatever that might mean. <laughs> what do you mean on counting? Yeah. What does that mean? Is this a Google Translate by any chance? Possibly. <laughs> Although, so one looks like one of the white swans. On the outfields of the world, we head towards the football stadium. So, what do you think? Abstract. Okay. <laughs> God, this is your. It goes on, app, isn't it? Like the brave tin soldiers, like the little big claws, as in Santa Claus. Oh yes, this is all Christian Hans Christian Andersen references, aren't they? Oh, is it right? Oh, this is good. Claps all Davs. What? Claps all Davs. <laughs> <laughs> No translation available. <laughs> I thought you weren't reading it in Danish. What's claps or dabs? Claps, as in put your hands together and okay. repeatedly smack them together. <laughs> and what's dabs? Claps all dabs. Claps all dabs. Claps all dabs, yeah. Yeah. Okay, like. fine. <clears throat> we are red. We are white. We stand together. That's probably well, you could the say most. That for, you could say that for England. We could, yeah, that's true. We'd probably say white and red, wouldn't we? No, red and white. Red, white. The colour would come first. Oh. Uh, we stand together side by side. We are red, we are white. We stand together side by side. Cello will aim to close his eye. Who's Cello? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Someone say Hans Christian Andersen and we'll just move on. When he sees a red football jersey. So Cello will aim to close his eye when he sees a red football jersey. He's telling the referee and he's just turning a blind eye to punching in the stomach of a defender. Good boy. We must fight for that country. There are balls raw. See that? <laughs> we must fight for that country. <laughs> yeah, we must fight for that country. But there you've got raw. They've got raw balls fighting for the country. There are balls raw. See that? I would. I'm paying money to see that. Raw balls. <laughs> Mother Denmark. Mother Denmark. Elska. Yeah. Mother Denmark. Elska Ale. Mother Denmark loves everyone. Der er bolde raset. You just made friends there with a load of Danes and now you're trying to piss them off. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so now I think you can appreciate that why that it has such a huge success. It's not just a top tune. It's not just a top tune. And it is a top tune. And for the 2010 FIFA World Cup... Is that like the 2010 World Cup? Yeah, for the 2010 FIFA World Cup and the 2010 FIFA World Cup... Both of them. In, both of them in South Africa. It was re-recorded by the Japanese pop band Vanilla Beans. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Apparently, they are very, they are an avid supporters for some reason of, of, Denmark. The, of the Danish <laughs> national team. Yeah, Vanilla Beans... Never heard talk of Vanilla about, Beans. Talk about irrelevances. But the uh, the duo who sang it 
originally, they came back to sing again and they, they changed it and had a slightly abbreviated version for the Japanese market. Fewer raw balls. And they did a bit of a Japanese accent as well. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Which is a bit weird because um, Denmark and Japan then went on to meet in the, the final pool match. And who did Vanilla Bean support in that instance? I mean, we'd have to ask Vanilla Beans. I, w- I would demand that you get in touch with Vanilla Bean and find out. Find out. <laughs> get in touch with them. Espresso. <laughs> How many Vanilla Beans make five? What do you mean? They, well, there's the old joke. Well, there's the old thing. How many beans make five, isn't it? That's all I was saying. I'm still not with you. Uh, what joke? What old joke? But anyway, I, I, I don't know why. The answer was two in each other, one up the other. <laughs> <laughs> This is like the elephant in the fridge, only much more public school. <laughs> so I don't understand the well, look, any I'm, of I'm this. I'm the only one here who didn't go to public school. Let's get that right. That's true, actually. It is true, yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. Oh, yeah, all right. We are failures of the public school system. <laughs> yeah. Paul, intercalated Olympic Games. Do you know anything about it? Because I, I really didn't do much research on that. Well, the first ones were held in Athens, weren't they, in 1896. Then there was there was one in Paris in 1900 and one in St. Louis in 1904. And they weren't that uh, successful because basically they were an adjunct to a World's Fair that was being held. Oh, right. Uh, at the time and so the olympic committee sort of thought okay let's go back to athens and what we're going to do then is we're going to have every four years we're going to have an alternate set of olympic games but they're going to be always held in athens and is that the intercalated that was the intercalated yes and so it would have been you know, London 1908, then back to Athens for the intercalated. Oh, I then, see. Was it Antwerp 1912? I don't know. And then back to Athens. But in coming up for 1910, Greece, I think, either at war or just coming out of a war and was virtually bankrupt, so couldn't afford to do it. So they didn't hold the 1910 Games. And then the 1914 Games and the 1918 Games were in the war. So the whole thing just... The whole idea of it just died away. Oh, uh, no, it's a shame. However, the 1908 Games were very successful and they sort of started a lot of the traditions like the opening ceremony, the closing ceremony, a relatively short time frame because I think the Paris Games and the London Games lasted months. Oh, really? <laughs> um, ag- actually, the way that the Olympic cycle works is the Olympic cycle su- starts immediately after the Games have finished so so it, it, you know when they had the games in beijing the day of the as soon as the closing ceremony happened yeah the london olympic cycle started and it ends when the games end oh so the olympics never end really they just they're just always the olympics. cycle <laughs> uh so what is in what is collated to be that in that in what way is it inter the collation of the other Olympic Games. Well, inter is, inter is just between. Uh, yeah, but what's collated? I've got inter. Cal, cal, I'm <laughs> well, guessing Well, collated, calendar. I guess, comes from calends, which is the, the um, Latin name for the start of a month. So sort yeah. of calendar then. So start of a... Well, that's where the word of calendar period. comes from. But it was a four-year cycle, as were the ancient Greek games. Do we need to start um, referring to the verdict as the intercalated podcast? podcast? <laughs> Yes, um, um, uh, it's sort of uh, like uh, uh, another term for a leap year is an intercalated year or a bisextile year. Do we need to start referring to the verdict as a bisextile <laughs> podcast? <laughs> we might get a lot more listeners. <laughs> I know we'll get a lot more passing traffic. That's for sure. <laughs> Can we talk about something interesting? Okay, go ahead. Let's talk about hot dogs. 
Oh yes. <laughs> Do you, have you ever have you ever eaten a hot dog? I had a Frankfurter. Okay, in a bun. Yes, in Germany. Yeah. Sounds like a hot dog then. <laughs> it's oh, a I long way of it. saying yes. I've had a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> Was this in East Germany when you were there? No, oh, no. The food in East Germany was awful. <laughs> so I got a message from Jesper, who listened to the, the episode, and uh, he said, and I quote, that was awesome about the podcast, just including that. I always loved it. It was a nice thing He's to a say. Great guy. <laughs> yeah. He said um, that was he... Was there a but? No, there's no but. No, oh, okay. it's just that. That was it. Yeah. And an and. Yeah. He really enjoyed the East German hot dog. I think maybe <laughs> yes. in the sense of us talking about it rather than eating one, I don't know. But he says that they have them in every gas station in Denmark, and for some reason they call them French hot dog. Like clever marketing, he says. <laughs> yeah, because I don't think that... Well, it's, it, it, it's like, problem, it? well, you know, what a Danish pastry is called in Denmark. Whoa, that's just <laughs> blown my brain. <laughs> that's and a the really good question. is Viennese pastries. Mm. Oh, is that right? And yet we have English mustard. We didn't change that. Well, there are other sorts of mustard available. Yeah, but we didn't change it, did we? We'll proudly write the word English on our mustard. Oh, but these are people, in the Danes' case, changing German to French, because presumably they are less keen on the Germans than they are the French. Oh, I thought for... it was more to do with, like, cuisine and the French sort of renowned oh, for maybe. their cuisine. Yeah, it could be. No, this is French. Oh, it must be delicious, I suppose it's all to do with the Schleswig holstein question. Yeah, probably. Oh, will it ever be solved? <laughs> <laughs> what is the Bleisting yeah. Stolpslog conundrum? What is that? What the Schleswig, the Schleswig Holstein question. <laughs> I'll do <it> him. <laughs> is it Germany or is it Denmark? I don't know what we're talking about. Well, I know what I'm talking about. All right, so let's go slower. What is the Reisting Holstein <laughs> conundrum? The slapstick hole behind question. <laughs> the Schleswig Holstein question was. Basically to do with who ruled the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein, whether it was the German king or em whether, whether it was the German emperor or whether it was the Danish king. Did the Germans come out on top in that particular scenario? No, sometimes they did. Sometimes they didn't. Uh, it's a question that rolls on to this day. Where, <laughs> uh, yeah, but, um, uh, I think the last part of it was, uh, was after the Second World War. There was a plebiscite there and the northern bit of Schleswig-Holstein voted to go into Denmark and the southern bit voted to stay in Germany. A bit like Saarland. Ah, yes, the Saars. They did want to stay with Germany, didn't they? Where are Saarland now? I, I, I don't recall from the episode. Did we talk about so they how got they disappeared? Reabsorbed. Yeah, so the French, want, the French and... No, the French wanted them to become an independent state, basically. Yeah. Uh, and they had a plebiscite also, a vote. And uh, the Saarland people voted by a fairly significant majority to become part of West Germany. Okay. Right. Two to one, wasn't you it? That, yeah. yeah, so if you were a Saarland national footballer, that meant you went from being a national footballer to being on the bench pretty immediately but still you're part of germany again which i guess is what they wanted yeah well the whole reason for that was of course france had no coal or very little coal whereas Saarland had loads of coal and it was right next door to france and uh, as alsace and lorraine were taken away by germany after 1871 they wanted a bit back amazing proper history just to go back to the important matter of the hot dog in a bun though yeah <laughs> I, can, I cannot shake in my mind this image of a la an East German laboratory yeah. where they're researching all these foods. And they've got hot dogs <laughs> and breads and they're trying desperately different ways to put them together. So someone finally came up with putting a hot dog in bread and this was a major breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> but if it was a baguette, surely they had to have an extra long hot dog. Uh, in fairness, I was improvising somewhat with the baguette. It's a short piece of uh, a piece of longish bread, I believe. I don't know what the exact requirements of a. So, talking of hot dogs, I did some research on unique hot dog toppings. So, I just wanted to know what your favourite might be. So, first of all, pineapple, bacon, and teriyaki. How, how about that? What do you mean by teriyaki? Uh, well, you put uh, pineapple on the hot dog, and then you put some bacon with some scallions. Yes, I know what pineapple and bacon are. And teriyaki sauce. Oh, just teriyaki sauce. So oh, okay, okay. So, how, would uh, you would you like would you like that? I never think I I never think meat and fruit mix. Okay, so you've got that. That's yours, all right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you... You can either you can either keep that one, that hot dog, or you can swap it for this next one. Blue cheese, hot sauce, and mozzarella. What, cheese and cheese? Yeah, blue cheese, hot sauce, and mozzarella. So you're going to keep your... No, I'll swap it for the cheese. You've now got that. 
The other one's gone. Teriyaki is gone. That is off the table. How do you come up with these ideas? <laughs> right, so you've got that one. How about a Caesar salad hot dog? Parmesan, a little bit of bacon, some salad on top. Hot, no. Hot lettuce. How do you fancy that? No. Keep, little I'll little, keep little, little anchovy on there? No, keep with the cheese. Keeping the cheese. All right. How about then sun-dried tomato, goat cheese and avocado? If that, you swap the goat's cheese for Stilton, that would be nice. No, it's goat cheese. No, absolutely not. If you had proper cheese like a cheddar and a goat's cheese, who on earth would go with the goat's cheese? You know, it's that distinctly second-rate option. Okay, so you've still got your cheesy hot dog in your hand. Can I tempt you with a French croissant instead of just a regular bun? So what, a franc... So you take a, a croissant, you cut it in half, you put a frankfurter in it, and then some crispy bacon. Can I tempt you away from your cheesy, cheesy hot dog? No. I'll be honest, Ron, this sounds like the culinary equivalent of our podcast. You take a random bread and <laughs> yeah. a random... <laughs> <laughs> You're making me feel hungry, though. Pasta salad, baked beans, and coleslaw on, on a bun with a frankfurter. How are you, you feeling about that one? You tempted? No, pasta salad's another one of those things. That's just that's just an excuse to use up old cold pasta. Okay, feta, bit of parsley. That's it. No, I don't want fetid cheese. Caramelized onions and cream cheese. Oh, that does sound nice. Oh, you're gonna swap? Yes. Oh, the Seattle hot dog, by the way. All right, Pete, this one for you. How about how about green papaya and dried shrimp coleslaw? Yeah, n- nothing that you've said since a hot dog has <laughs> appealed to me in the slightest, I'll be honest. I think Pete's a pie man. I, I would have a pie, but actually I, I think I would think outside the box and I would reveal my lobster. I mean, that sounds Start ruder than any of <laughs> <laughs> I'd have a full lobster... Uh, possibly a bisque, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, just out I'd have three meal. courses, a soup, <laughs> a, main course, a little fold out table. I'm like, yeah, your hot dogs are nothing compared to my preparedness. You know you'd stuff your napkin in and... Exactly. And in fact, I also wouldn't be in a football arena, I'd be in a restaurant. Uh, there may be football on in the background. <laughs> that's how, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not. That's entirely optional. <laughs> Paul. Yes. Do you have any questions for us? This is your opportunity to ask us anything that's been bugging you or anything you'd like to further elaboration on prior to you making your judgment. How many times, Ryan, has Denmark won the European Championship? Once. And the same question, (laughs) mutatis mutantis. Phones on mute and off airplane. Phones on airplane. (laughs) No, no. Phones on airplane. Leave me alone. Stop impressing uh, and me. <laughs> Peter? Yeah, come on, Peter. How many times yes. have, he, have Germany well, won the Euros? Firstly, I'd like to say I think that's an excellent question. I've really enjoyed that you asked that question. Uh, oh, he's gone all politician. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to answer the question. I'm, I want to face into this question directly and answer it clearly and without doubt. Right. I don't want to hedge. I want to be just very... Uh, you, you, at least you're giving answer. me time to look it up. And, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, everyone's looking this up. Because I don't know. And <laughs> Ryan, the answer can is... You tell me? <laughs> I still don't know. One, two, three. Three, I think. Oh, curiously. Why are you saying you think he doesn't know? It says three here, but then I still thought it was four, but 2024 <laughs> is hosted by Germany. I, I knew that uh, Denmark had won it. What, what did they get a buy into the competition and then they won it? That's right. Yugoslavia were going through some uh, war-related scenario. <laughs> and so uh, by them being excluded, Denmark were included and went on to win. Yes. It was quite extraordinary. Okay, it's time for the music. Reporters need our judge. Judging all the things we does. Always for the judge. Um, I would give the episode a B. Okay. Oh, don't sound so disappointed. Well, I'm a little bit disappointed. Yeah, there was a lot of. There was a lot of. I thought if if I was ever going to get a higher grade, it would be when a Pete was with me on the on the episode. <laughs> <laughs> You've dragged me down, Weir. <laughs> if it was a match, it would be a home win. A home Ooh. win. 
to the Danish, the Danes, right? the Danes yeah. Hooray! Right. Congratulations, sir. Hand, oh, shake hands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll and see you at the World played, Cups. Well played, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was mainly because um, I accepted your blue and I thought that worked in well. I didn't really accept business oh. was worked in because uh, Pete said at one point, oh, I'm not going to talk about business. I'm going to talk about something else. <laughs> Yeah, that doesn't help your case, Pete. What's Maybe your response to that? I could have that? phrased that more uh, accurately. I could have said, I am going to talk about business <laughs> and then talked about something else. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, I guess, is our show for this time. Thank you very much for listening, all you out there. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch about anything we've talked about, anything you've heard, you can email us at hhepodcast at gmail.com or you can contact us through hhepodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. You never know, you might end up featured on a future show. And one way to definitely feature on a future show is to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. There are many providers that provide podcasts, but for some reason, Apple's the only one where you can actually rate. And it really does help us. Let's us know that you're enjoying the show. Otherwise, you can find us on TikTok and on Instagram and all the other social medias as well at HHE Podcast. So, of course, you can go back and listen to all our old shows on your podcast provider, HHE Podcast dot com and all those places so if you do get bored and you haven't heard all of our back catalogue it is there waiting for you all right well paul thanks again for being awesome oh well, thank you for sticking with me ah oh, and pete it was a pleasure doing an episode with you likewise it was nice to go together for once wasn't it maybe we'll do it again one day maybe one who day knows if something special comes up we can do it that's right but in the meantime all that's left to say is you've been listening to History happened everywhere. The verdict. So who, who was your commentator? He was very good. Uh, it's a, a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Jim Colson. Or James, you can call him. He was remarkable. Yeah, he was really good. It was great to have Jim on. So that's Jim from Bewildered Dad and also Loose Dad's podcast. Uh, so is he a new father? He has two ch- two young children, yeah. You'd worry if he didn't. <laughs> yes, he would, wouldn't he? I guess that's why he's bewildered. That's why he's bewildered, yeah. <laughs> makes a lot more sense. <laughs>